We come now to multi-party secure computation, generalizing our prior setting of two parties to one where there's n parties, three or more, each with their own private inputs and wanting to jointly compute some function on all of them while preserving privacy to the best extent possible. We'll start by talking about functionalities, which represent the task or the function the parties are trying to compute. This is not the protocol, it's the goal effectively. So an end party functionality is a pair of algorithms. One is an initialization one, and its job is to generate keys or long-term inputs for each of the end parties. Once those are in place, each party has its own actual input, x sub i, and the function, the functionality describes what outputs the party should get. So on input x1 through xn with access to the initial inputs, it returns a list y1 through yn, and y sub i is the desired output for party i. It's often useful to indicate the output of a particular party by uh, this notation applied to the list of all outputs. Now, while these in long-term initialization inputs or keys, or whatever you call them, are sometimes useful, they're often not necessary. And when they don't exist, we refer to the functionality as keyless, and then we might just omit writing them. So once we have a target functionality, we're interested in designing a secure computation protocol for it. So what is that about in terms of setting and, and what it accomplishes? We imagine that each of these n parties is um, communicating through pairwise secure channels with the others. In other words, each pair i and j of parties is connected by a channel that's both private and authentic, and we might write that as i r o j. In some cases, there's also a broadcast channel assumed. How these channels are created is not part of the context of the MPC protocol. You might create it using all the nice cryptography we've studied so far, or maybe for some other out-of-band means. Now, the party P sub i is initialized with its long-term input, and then it will bring into the protocol itself whatever its actual input X sub i is. At this point, the parties can start interacting. The protocol will consist of a sequence of rounds, and in each round, all parties send messages to all other parties. You could imagine at the beginning of the round, they all send a message to each other, to the, every other party, and at the end they receive, and then the next round goes on. At the end of the protocol, each party will have a, a local private output, which we call Y sub i. Now, if we were to set all this up formally, we would need uh, to describe this as a syntactic object. We would need a syntax for the protocol. And that can be given. This protocol will actually be a single randomized algorithm, which uh, says how the parties compute and the messages that they send to each other. This algorithm would say, take input a current incoming message and the current state of the party or its randomness, and then say what's the next outgoing message. And finally, it would say how the outputs are computed. But we won't go that far. We won't specify the syntax or specify protocols through it, but rather depict them more informally. Correctness, of course, is with respect to whatever functionality we're trying to compute. So correctness for functionality f of a protocol pi means that after you run pi, the parties um, end up with the correct outputs as given by this functionality. Each of them gets y sub i, where x1 through xn were the starting inputs. Turning to security, there's going to be an integer parameter t that parameterizes security. It designates the number or the maximum number of players who are dishonest. We could also say bad or corrupted, and hence we might sometimes talk of T privacy. So what that means is that you will consider some subset 
arbitrary but of size at most t of the players who's who you view as trying to learn the inputs of the uh, of the other players so they are curious about the values in this set and privacy will simply ask that they not learn anything about those values subject of course to the fact that at the end of the protocol these bad players do learn their own outputs and that will tell them something about these inputs but they shouldn't learn more than that as with the two-party setting there are many uh, different definitions of security many different settings and so forth and two prominent ones are the semi-honest and malicious the semi-honest one also called honest but curious players means that although the parties in this set T are attempting to learn the inputs of the other parties, they do respect the rules of the protocol with regard to how they compute and send messages to each other. They perform the required actions. At the end of it, however, they gather all the information the other parties send and then start trying to mine in that information to figure out the inputs of the other parties. But in the malicious setting, they go further. The bad players may decide to deviate from the instructions of the protocol and rather than running pi, they send messages in any way they want, computed in any way they want, and hope by this to get information from the messages that come back that tells them something about the inputs of the other parties. And we will only consider the semi-honest setting here. MPC is a, is a large universe at this point. It's a topic of uh, widespread interest. It has a large literature in the research community which shows that defining privacy and even correctness is something quite delicate. There are many definitions, but a prominent one is what's called universally composable uh, security. When it comes to protocols, as we've seen before, it's often been the um, culture of cryptographers to target to start with general solutions. This means I'm handed an arbitrary functionality and I ask if I can design an MPC protocol to securely compute that. And perhaps surprisingly and interestingly, the answer is you can. And such protocols have been given um, since the 1980s and they are able to tolerate um, a certain number of bad players which could be up to n over 3 or even in some models and in some cases up to a, just short of a mid of half of the of the players the way these work is that they don't try to understand what the functionality is doing rather they view it as a program or a circuit and they do a kind of gate by gate evaluation uh, of the functionality there's a great deal of interest in uh, uh, MPC in the industry now. So there's quite a lot of demand and that has kind of fueled also research interest. And so there's a lot of work on efficient protocols and this can be both for this general setting or for some specific functionalities of interest. There are many implementations, there are numerous startups in this space and uh, so a lot of ex uh, exciting activity. We might look, for example, at um, this as a, as a resource which points to quite a lot of what's going on. So this gives you some pointers to books and so forth and courses about this, um, tutorials, software, and then in this software there's frameworks, primitives, uh, particular protocols, uh, tools, um, retired software, so all, all kinds of stuff. So I, a lot of um, material to explore. All right, so what uh, what do we envisage we can do with multi-party computation? So uh, Lindell, who is one of the leaders in this space, likes to divide applications into two classes that he calls privacy and security. So privacy kind of reflects applications which are in the spirit of what we describe the problem to be, which is that you actually have distinct parties kind of with competing interests and privacy concerns who are entering with inputs that they want to protect and are unique to themselves, and then they want to evaluate this joint function across them. 
The other class, which he calls security, is where MPC becomes a tool for more conventional goals. And the canonical example there is that you start actually with a single secret, like a key for a cryptographic system. But since you're worried about compromise of the key if it's stored in a one place, you share it using secret sharing across N servers who now become the parties. And where MPC enters is that whatever cryptographic function you wanted to compute on the key, you now compute distrib distributively through the protocol on the shares of the key. So in the following, we're going to discuss one example in each category, private sum as a sort of privacy application and threshold signatures yeah, for the second. But uh, beyond that, the kinds of things that people talk about with regard to MPC um, are the following. You imagine that these parties have as their inputs or, or, or data sets, right? The commodity of the present moment is, is large sets of data. And they want to mine this. They want to run a machine learning algorithm and develop a model so that the model can later be queried. But they have some privacy concerns about their data sets and they don't want to actually provide them to other parties so that a machine learning algorithm can in fact be jointly and directly run on the data. So they resort to MPC. The function that our functionality here is um, to run the machine learning algorithm and output the model as a result. And that's what the MPC protocol will do. So you could imagine that these parties are healthcare organizations, that the data is healthcare or genomic data, and it might be hospitals, research organizations, or so forth. It could also be data, you know, gathered by Netflix or something like that on what movies you like to watch being um, shared with similar data gathered by some other service to create models to give you better um, suggestions for the next movie to watch or who knows what. As you can see in this domain, you can get imaginative to whatever nth degree you want about applications. Okay, so now coming back to Earth with something a little bit more concrete is that we're going to talk about how you um, compute the sum function. So the setup here is that each party has an input which we see as an integer in Z mod n. And what the parties want to know is the sum of all these inputs. The sum, to be clear, is computed as an integer. It's not mod anything or in any group, uh, although that will enter the protocol at a later time. Of course, the main thing is the privacy constraint. So party I doesn't even want to reveal its input to the others. So we might ask why, or whether there's any use for this particular application. You can imagine a few. For example, the parties are students in a class. Their inputs are their scores on the most recent quiz. So numbers between 0 and 100, and hence in, the, in Z mod 101. Why do they want the sum? Well, they don't actually, but they want the average. And the average and the sum are the same. You, you just divide by n. Uh, the sum and you get the average in case your your professor didn't you know provide the average you get it want to get it this way of course the students don't want to reveal their scores to each other which is the privacy constraint you could have um, a corporation or some set of employees of a company who are curious as to whether what they're making is above or below what other people are making but people don't usually want to reveal their salaries. So here the input of the players is a salary. We'll fix some range for it by simply setting a very large upper bound, which we expect nobody's salary to exceed, simply because the problem requires us to set some upper bound. Again, they're not actually interested in the sum, they're interested in the average, but if you compute the sum, you compute the average. Finally, you can go the other way. Rather than having a big range, you have a very small one. Now the inputs are binary, 0 or 1. They might represent votes of some voter on a proposition. This time you really do want the sum. It's the tally, how many votes the proposition got. 
And of course, individuals' votes are private, so we want to protect that. All right, so we, if we want to approach computing this securely, we first want to encapsulate it as a functionality that will be our target. What we do for that is we multiply the upper bound on the size of each input by the number of players to get a number we call m. Now we're going to ask for a protocol to compute this, and um, we're going to shoot for a, uh, just for simplicity, for an n minus 1 private protocol. And uh, the protocol functionality is the following keyless one. What it does is on input the, the values of the players, it simply computes the sum and returns it. Except we're going to compute the sum modulo this number m. Uh, why are we doing that? Because in the protocol, we will need to work in some domain and we will use the m for it. But from the point of view of our application, we claim we've set things up so that this mod m doesn't actually matter. Why is that? Because if your inputs actually are in Zn, then if you sum them up, you notice that this sum cannot exceed this value over here because no individual input exceeds this and there are at most this many. So the mod m effectively makes no difference. Whether you mod by m or not, you get the same result, which is the actual integer sum. So this will solve the problem we wanted to solve. It will actually solve something a little more general. Now, whenever one discusses secure computation, multi-party secure computation, it's presented as saying, well, you don't learn anything about the inputs of the other parties. Of course, it's not quite that. What you don't learn is anything about the inputs of the other parties other than given by the output function value that you obtain. But what's perhaps worth um, being aware of is that that function value can, in fact, tell you a fair amount about the other inputs. And when you run the protocol, you're effectively agreeing to that. And if that's not something MPC protects you against. So we could visualize that here. Suppose, for example, there are four parties. Well, at the end of the protocol, all parties learn this sum, mod m or whatever. Well, if you look at party one then, it knows its own input and the sum. So it can, in fact, figure out the sum of the inputs of the other parties. Okay, so something about those other inputs. Now suppose parties one and two come together. After, after all, we're considering T privacy, which means some number of parties collude and come together. They know their own inputs and the sum. They can actually figure out the sum of the inputs of the two remaining parties, and that's starting to get more significant. If three parties collude, uh, they can actually figure out in its entirety the input of the last party. So at this point, party four has no privacy left. Nonetheless, from a MPC perspective, we say that the protocol is private because this is unavoidable. If you reveal the sum, this will get revealed. But again, you have to consider that suppose you are, for example, doing salary uh, computations. Um, even say if you're in a setting with a, something like this, you already know just out of context the kind of ballpark or a guess as to other people's salaries. You may have, in that sense, partial information. And so it's possible that these losses can be exploited in a practical setting to lead to real losses of privacy. This has nothing to do formally with MPC. MPC simply accepts that. But from a practical perspective, it may be worth knowing about and thinking about when you actually use MPC. And to just remember that the guarantee is not that nothing leaks. It's that nothing leaks other than the value of the functionality you're computing. Anyway, with that understood, let's try to do this. Let's try to write a protocol to do this private sum functionality. We're going to leverage secret sharing. Remember that we gave a n minus 1 out of n perfect secret sharing scheme. 
we were able to give that over any additive group. And we now set the group to Zm. Remember, m is the modulus relative to which everything is performed. So what do the parties do? Well, each party i begins by sharing its input. So it takes its input x sub i and it runs the sharing algorithm on that to generate n shares. We'll denote the shares generated by party i by x i j. And then it sends the jth share to the jth party. This is done securely. Remember that there's an i through j secure channel, private and authenticated, and it's used to convey that share. Note that all parties are doing this. So you might visualize what's happening, illustrated for four players here. Party one has created these shares. These all sum up modulo m to its secret. Party two creates these shares which sum up modulo m to its secret and so forth. Then they transmit. At the end of the transmission, if you look at party one, this column represents what it received. It's received the first share of its own input, of the second party's input, the third party's and the fourth party's. Okay. Rows are uh, the shares, columns are the what you receive. Now, we've done this, of course, because we don't want to explicitly reveal x sub i to other parties, but we want to compute over it. And so we've spread x sub i out. But now we have the task of somehow putting things together and coming up with the sum. And towards that, what we notice is that the sum is kind of hidden in this matrix in an interesting way. After all, if you, if you add this row, you get x1. You add the things in this row, you get x2. So that means if you add everything in the whole matrix, you get the sum of all these, which is the desired sum. So our goal then is to, is to sum everything in the matrix. But rather than sum row-wise, what if we sum column-wise? We'll get the same sum. And so that's what um, we're going to do uh, in the protocol. So the next step in the protocol then is that now each party has whatever is listed in its, in, in its column. So what it does is that it sums everything it receives. So party one then has the sum of all of these, party two has the sum of all of these, and so forth. Everything, of course, being done mod m. Analytically, the, the jth party will sum these things here. This is the jth shares of all the secrets. Once it computes that sum, it, it's not going to keep it private in any way. It will simply broadcast it or send it to all parties. So now everybody knows all the column sums. And so everybody can do the following. Uh, having received all these co column sums, they simply add them up, mod m, of course. And that's what we want, because the column sums are, of course, also the sum of all entries of the matrix, which are also all the row sums. And that's our protocol. Now, um, we could check the um, correctness if we like. It's a little pedantic because somehow it should be obvious from the picture that we get the, the, the sum of the entry, all the entries of the matrix is the same as the sum of the original secrets. But if you want to write it analytically, um, we see that the ith secret is this, uh, the sum of all its shares. Why is that? Because that's what the n minus 1 out of n secret sharing scheme does for us. We have defined the column sums as computed by the jth party in round two as uh, the sum here of the jth shares across all the different parties. So now, uh, what is it that the protocol outputs? It's the sum of all these column sums. Just plug in this over here um, and you get this. And now a nice thing about summation, you can change the order. When you change the order, here you get this, which is the input, uh, the secret of that party. And then the sum of the secrets is, of course, exactly what we want to compute. So that was simple enough. And now we turn to privacy, to asking why it may be private. Now, 
to actually say something rigorous about that is a lot more work than we're going to do here. It's going to need precise definitions and uh, claims and proofs and so forth, and we're not going to do any of that. And so the intent here is just to kind of eyeball this a little and decide that, yeah, it looks like it provides some privacy. So you might start by saying, consider player one. What is it that player one knows at the end of the protocol? Well, it knows its own input. It knows the shares it generated for that. And it has received all these things from the other parties and hence also knows uh, the column sum. Finally, it received the column sums from all the other parties. So the red stuff um, is what it knows. And what is it trying to figure out? Well, maybe what is x2? And you look at that and you say, but what does it know about x2? Just this and then well, it knows this column sum and hence a little bit, it kind of knows the sum of all these three. But if you look at what it knows, everything has a random component from the secret sharing and it actually has no information about x2 that it can figure out. And this argument extends as you um, throw in more colluding players. But again, it's not, this isn't that obvious either as a claim or to actually establish it. All right, so let's move on. Um, as indicated earlier, we're trying to illustrate two styles of MPC applications. What we illustrated above was the privacy style in which parties start out with inputs whose values they want to protect. And then, then they're, but they're curious about the value of some function on them. Now we're gonna look at another case where the parties are created to solve um, a practical key exposure problem. So the background here is to remember that whenever we do basic cryptography, encryption, um, decryption, signing, and so forth, we rely on secret keys. If those secret keys are exposed to the adversary, there's no sec uh, security left anymore. To run the, the algorithms, However, we need to store that secret key on some system. But we know that systems are vulnerable. We hear constantly about breaches, uh, malware being infiltrated onto them, insider attacks, um, phishing attacks, and so forth. And all of these things put these secret keys at the risk of exposure. So one of the approaches suggested to mitigate this risk is that you never store your key in one location. There's no unique place where the key actually appears. Instead, you take a TN secret sharing scheme and you create shares of your secret key through running the sharing algorithm. So call those shares uh, this. And then you, you put SKI, the ith share, on a dedicated server I. So that means that as the owner of the key, you have to somehow uh, create or um, uh, start up these end servers and um, then put keys on them. And now the property we have is that even if T minus one of these servers are compromised, that will not expose our original key because this is a TN secret sharing scheme from T of these values, T minus one of these values, the adversary does not get um, any information about the secret. I guess I should say T rather than T minus one. So this is, this is what is supposedly been gained, right? So we've increased hopefully our resistance to key exposure, but it also brings in a problem we don't just want to store this key, we want to compute something on it, like a decryption or a signature or something. How are we going to do that when the key is no longer present, but rather exists only as shares across different machines? Well, the answer is an MPC protocol. We run the protocol having defined the functionality appropriately to capture whatever cryptographic capability we want. And this class of applications is often called threshold cryptography. So let's in particular consider signatures. This is interesting because now the SKR secret key is the signing key 
for some signature scheme as might be used, say, by a certificate authority. Remember, a certificate authority signs all the public keys uh, through the creation of certificates that are used across the internet and in TLS and things like that. So the secret signing key of the certificate authority is quite valuable and its exposure would be extremely damaging. So not only could an adversary start forging certificates, we would hopefully expect that to be soon discovered, but once that key has been exposed, we pretty much are forced to invalidate all certificates the certificate authority has ever issued in its lifetime because we have no way to distinguish fraudulent ones from real ones. And invalidation of millions of certificates would significantly disrupt all the internet services we use because they all rely on TLS and uh, the client-server-side authentication, as we've seen. So the, the, the short of that is that certificate authority signing keys are things we'd like to protect against exposure. Another example is that the signing key could be uh, could be a Bitcoin key. In other words, the verification key is your Bitcoin address to which coins are sent. And um, effectively, your balance is tied to this secret key. If that key is exposed, all the money held under your account would be stolen. So we want to protect that signing key as well. We're going to illustrate how to do threshold signatures for the specific case of the signing scheme being a RSA full domain hash. So recall how that works and uh, also to back up a bit, of course, we need to fix some signing scheme whose signatures we're computing and we're going to pick RSA full domain hash. This is an RSA scheme. The verification key is the modulus and encryption exponent. Signing key is the modulus and decryption exponent. And remember that in this scheme, the way you sign a message M as you hash it with the hash function that has range Z and star, and then you decrypt that hash, you raise it to the dth power mod n. And so effectively, the sensitive secret here is the decryption exponent d. We could um, target uh, getting an MPC protocol that's um, t private for any value of t, but we're going to focus on t equals n minus 1. That means that all the players come together to run the protocol, but it should be secure even if n minus one of them are compromised. A tool we're going to use for this is, of course, a secret sharing scheme. And we're again going to, as before, use our n minus one out of n secret sharing scheme, the quite simple additive one we described. But we're going to change the group that underlies it. The group here is going to be z star z mod phi of n. So remember, phi of n, the phi function of n, is the order of the group z n star. And we're going to look at the additive group in which operations are modulo phi of n. And the reason for this, of course, is that our secret d lies in this space. So the first step is sharing of the key. So the key here is effectively d. We'll think of the signer, the original one, as now just being party one. There are all these other parties that have been created to help with this process. So it runs the sharing algorithm on D, and that generates a list of shares. We'll call D1 through D sub n. And now it will communicate D sub i to the ith party using the secure channel that MPC always assumes. So over that channel, you, you send this D sub i. Once that's done, the signer will delete the original secret D from its system. So this is achieving the goal that the D is not present anywhere. Nonetheless, it's implicitly there. Why is that? Because remember, the secret sharing guarantees this equation, illustrated here for the case where we have five parties as an example. If you sum the shares of all those five parties, modulo phi of n, because we're working here in whatever group underlies the secret sharing, um, you will get back the original secret. So although d is deleted physically, it's present implicitly mathematically in this way. Furthermore, 
if you look at any n minus 1 parties, any 4 in this particular example, you know from the secret sharing scheme's privacy that if you compromise them and obtain these d sub i's, you learn nothing about the original secret d. No information is revealed because those d sub i's just look like random independent strings in the in z phi of n. So, so far so good. The difficulty, however, is that we haven't yet computed a signature. We still need to actually figure out how we sign messages. And that's where MPC comes in. So now uh, a message comes in to be signed and all parties in the protocol know the message. How could we generate the signature? Well, consider the following. What party I says is, well, I have my share D sub I. Let me send it back to party one over the secure channel communicate from I to one. Party one at this point has all the D sub I's and it can run the recovery algorithm of the secret sharing scheme. And since D sub I's are shares of D, it will end up with its original secret back again. And then of course it can compute the signature, which for us means hash the message and raise to the dear power mod n. Having done that, since it knows D is sensitive, it very quickly deletes D from its system. Well, have we progressed? A little, you might say, because at least D is not permanently stored on any system. But still, things are not that good because at least for short periods of time, ephemerally, this secret D is present in one location, which is party one system. And thereby, if that system is compromised, it's subject to compromise. And this situation gets worse if you consider that the signing operation is frequent. If you're signing hundreds of thousands of certificates a day, it could be quite long periods overall that this key resides on that system, which will increase the risk of exposure. Okay, but there's actually something even worse that's hidden under the rug over here. Consider this recovery process here. It works over the group and we know the simple equation it uses. All it needs to do is add the shares and that will recover the secret. But remember addition is in the group and the group here is z phi of n. So in order to run recovery here, the party one actually needs to know phi of n. Otherwise it can't do this mod operation. Well, where does it get phi of n? It's not something it can easily compute given n, that this is a hard function to compute. It would have to simply store phi of n on its system. But this is a problem because now uh, if someone breaks into the system, they will expose phi of n. And if you recall the math of RSA, once you know phi of n, you can actually factor n and thereby compute the decryption exponent. When you look at it this way, you actually see we've made no progress at all. We still have effectively the secret key residing on um, a, in a single place in party one system. Now you could ex uh, try to get around this in different ways. You could, for example, also share phi of n out and then have it reconstructed through returning the shares or many other things. But it's not clear how much it helps and we'll do something a little better. So um, again, the setting we have, the ith party has the modulus, which is public and it's share d sub i, where all the d sub i's add up to d mod phi of n, and we know the message to be signed. What party i does is it computes what we call a partial signature. It hashes the message and raises to the power of its share mod n. And then it sends that over to the first party. Okay, since all parties do this at the end, party one has all of these x sub i values and it's going to multiply them mod n. Notice that it doesn't need phi of n anymore. This is mod n and n is public. And we claim that that if it outputs is actually the signature of m. The algebra is pretty simple. Look at what x is. It's the product of all the x sub i's mod n. But the x sub i's are the hashed message raised to the power of these shares d sub i. This product, of course, can also be written as h of m to the power of this sum. 
Now the sum is written here is over the integers. We're just adding these as integers. But our group theory tells us that in the exponents, you can always throw in a mod the group order, the group order here being phi of n. Mathematically, there's no difference whether you sum as integers or you do the mod, it doesn't matter. But from our perspective, it's convenient because we now recognize that this thing here, the sum mod phi of n, is in fact our original exponent d. Why is that? Because the secret sharing guarantees exactly that. And so now we simply recover the signature. All right, so we've successfully um, given uh, at least a candidate protocol for threshold RSA. Now let's um, back up a little bit here um, to fit this better into the context of MPC by trying to say what functionality we've computed by this protocol. We've done things a little backwards by giving the protocol before the functionality. So formally, when we talk about RSCFDH, there's going to be some RSA generator that underlies that scheme. So let KRSA denote that. And consider the following n party functionality. Functionality in the initial stage has to perform the setup work. So it will run the generator and thereby obtain both the public key and the secret key. And it will actually do the secret sharing it'll share D to generate these shares over here. And the initial inputs of the parties are then um, uh, these shares, right? So, so this says that each party is initialized with D sub i. So when we enter the MPC protocol, the assumption is that the ith party has this and the way that assumption is encapsulated formally is through this initialization step of the functionality. In the actual protocol, each party has input the message M, and our job is to compute this signature over here, uh, which is written in this way. We could write it in many ways, but the job of the functionality is only to indicate what output you, is desired, not to say how you communicate amongst the parties to get it. That's the job of the protocol. We're going to designate the output as just going to party one. The others get nothing. What secret sharing scheme have we used here? It's the usual one, the n minus one over n one over z phi of n, where n is whatever emerged over here. And then once we have this functionality, we can go back and claim that the protocol we gave is correct relative to this functionality and also somehow has some uh, privacy attributes. But it's perhaps more um, revealing or at least concrete to think about the privacy and security of this protocol directly. So what is it we would want from a threshold signature scheme? And so let's um, informally or at a high level kind of think about it that way through a specification of, a, of at least a game-like um, definition. So an adversary attacking threshold, uh, our threshold protocol would start out being given the verification key, which is the modulus and encryption exponent. We would then allow it to corrupt so a certain number of players. It can specify some set of players, of course, restricted to not be all of them. This is a t equal n minus one scheme, so it can corrupt up to n minus one players, and it gets all of their shares. We know that that by itself is not going to tell it anything about D, but perhaps in conjunction with what comes later it might, so we, we definitely want to consider that. Now furthermore, this adversary is allowed a chosen message attack as in a normal signature scheme. In this case it means it, it goes to party one and says, please run the protocol to give me a signature of this message that I hand you. So party one then starts off the protocol and that means it receives from all the other parties their partial signatures and generates a full signature. And our adversary will get everything, all messages either sent to or received by parties in the set that it corrupts. So it has um, all their partial signatures. And also it knows whatever random choices they made. This turns out to be none in our protocol, so this is just kind of a 
therefore, for generality. So what security then asks is consider or think of this as a signature scheme. We're worried about forgery. Forgery means outputting some message which is not one whose signature was requested and yet having a valid signature of it. And so the definition would say you are not able to do that even after this process over here. And so our claim would be that if we formalize this way again, which, which can be done without huge effort, uh, we will be able to show, assuming the one-wayness of the RS generator, that that threshold protocol provides this property. All right. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit, not in a technical sense, but more in a philosophical sense. So we're going to step back and, and kind of change our mood and outlook to ask ourselves questions which are not asked often, in fact, very seldom, uh, and much less than they should be in the context that we find ourselves, which is um, academic uh, education institutions, but even more broadly in industry or the, the fort. The kind of question I want to ask is, yes, we have all this technology here, in particular MPC or cryptography, but it beyond AI and ML or any other technology we have, who benefits from this? Who is it that's helped? Who is it that's has an improved life? And in particular, what is the societal impact of these technologies that we develop? Now, asking a question like that, or at least answering it uh, in a productive way, requires a little bit of background in understanding how modern technology is used um, in, the, in the economic sphere that we've created for ourselves. And what we see is that corporations collect data about us. This is kind of the basis of our current economic system, which uh, has been called surveillance capitalism. It's about the collection of data, the mining of that data to create models through machine learning algorithms, and then using that to influence our behavior and our choices. It starts out simply with placement of ads, but it goes on to many things where they can influence buying behaviors and um, viewing behaviors and <clears throat> compete for our attention. This um, economy of surveillance capitalism brings huge profits to assert the corporations that employ it. But the side of it that perhaps is not as well popularized is that it has a negative impact on us as human beings, on our human lives and on the way society functions and on liberty. And this is something that is visible when you look for it. Surveillance capitalism as a term was popularized by Shoshana Zuboff. Um, I would encourage watching, for example, this, this YouTube documentary over here or her very long book, but still worth reading on the subject. If you look at Wikipedia, it says surveillance capitalism is an economic system centered around the commodification of personal data with the core purpose of profit making for the corporations that employ it. And surveillance capital exploits and controls human nature. And they point out that collecting and processing data might present a danger to human liberty, autonomy, and well-being. Capitalism has become focused on expanding the proportion of social life that is open to data collection. This stuff is invasive in terms of how much of our lives it accesses. And this may come with significant implications for vulnerability and control of society as well as for privacy. You can find many resources about this, books, videos, movies. Kathy O'Neill is one of the early pioneers who wrote about um, all the social biases and impacts of um, machine learning technology. There are movies like The Social Dilemma, which studies social media and how we are manipulated by it. Coded bias such as studies um, racism engendered by this. Where does MPC enter this? Well, MPC is often popularized via stories that might take the following form. You have this bunch of parties, each of them has a data set. 
we can now think that it's the type of data sets we've been discussing above. And they want to compute a function, which is actually to run an ML algorithm and create a model. But their inputs are sensitive. They don't want to share them. And so what can they do? Well, to the rescue comes an MPC protocol, which allows them to do what they want. And in this story, MPC is a privacy enabling or privacy providing tool. Because the story is that the data is my data, your data. It's our healthcare information, which is present in um, hospitals or research organizations. And we want this information to be kept private. But on the other hand, we also want the cure for cancer, right? And if we understand that putting all this data together is going to help find that cure, well, it's a good thing to do that. So MPC is a way to allow parties to reach <clears throat> beneficial goals without compromising individual privacy. So I would like to take a different perspective that turns that story on its head. <clears throat> and the alternative viewpoint, quite drastically, is that MPC is actually a way to violate privacy. And as such, it can be used to support and extend surveillance capitalism. Why is that? Well, let's go back to the story. We said these parties want to protect the privacy of their inputs. But whose privacy is that? Whose, in, whose interests are they protecting? I would suggest it's not your and mine. It's not our information they care about. That its privacy has already been violated merely by the fact that they've collected that information. Rather, their data set is of large financial value to them. Each party owns this data and uh, wants to exploit that uh, and gain financially from it. So the reason they don't want to expose the data is their financial interest. And the MPC protocol helps them co collaborate with others so that this set of empowered parties can continue to effectively exploit that data and further surveillance capitalism. Now, uh, just as a sort of brief um, parenthetical remark, as written here to say including FHE, is because fully homorphic encryption is in fact, while presented and even viewed in industry as a different technology than MPC, when it comes to what problems it solves, it's really the problem it solves is MPC. The only difference is a different kind of trade-off between costs and convenience than other choices of MPC protocols. So everything said about MPC also applies to FHE. So in this viewpoint then, uh, the difficulty is that if MPC was either not present or couldn't be used for some reason, we may actually gain privacy because the law can then step in to prevent certain kinds of data and information sharing, or simply the party's own selfish interests will preclude their doing that. But now they can say, look, we aren't actually revealing your data. We're computing the some functions on it. The difficulty is that that function is the only thing they want to compute. And effectively, all the privacy all the information they want about the data is present in the result of that function. And so um, effectively, the fact that the rest is private is, is insignificant. So if, if something like this happens, then MPC can actually help the AI models and surveillance apparatus to get more sophisticated and potentially more damaging. Now, this is not to deny that MPC has valuable social um, applications. We've even seen, for example, Callisto as a tool for the prevention of helps identification of, uh, of uh, sexual uh, perpetrators of sexual violence or private set membership for applications like Have I Been Pawn. But while these are nice, they're not economically significant in the way that surveillance capitalism is. So where all this is going is largely a suggestion to you to increase your awareness of 
what is done with the technology that you study and develop. The education of computer science is almost exclusively technical. What you learn in, and are taught is to understand tools and to make tools and to write software and develop algorithms. And most students dream at the end of this of getting a job at some large corporation with a nice salary. But what these corporations practice as their business is in fact surveillance capitalism and to a large extent working at them helps further that. So why not step back a bit and ask what is the social impact of different technologies we develop? Who does it actually help beyond making money for your employer? Does it help those in power who already have um, uh, money or does it help people? And can we think about changing the course so that the technology we have is a way to actually help people. And so I leave you with these hopefully provocative questions.